morning. How's everyone doing today? Good. Uh, we need like more energy. Come on, it's almost break, right? You get to go home for the holidays and have fun, or maybe not if you're with your family. I'm just kidding. Um, hey, so listen, how many of you, tell, tell me why you're getting a degree in business. You can just shout it out. Why did you choose this major? Start a business. Start a business. You needed the credit. To affect my community. To affect his community in a positive way. OK, anybody else? Money. Money. All right. I, I expected to hear that one first. Yeah. Lots of opportunities. Opportunities. OK. Last one. Going once, going twice. Anyone want to shout out something that wasn't covered? OK. So next question for you is, I want to know what podcast you're listening to. Andrew like, Tate. Andrew Tate. <laughs> OK. What else we got? Uh, Alex Ramosi. Alex Ramosi. Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan. OK, there we go. Anybody else listen to podcasts? Rich Roll. Who is that? Rich. Rich Roll, yes. OK. Last one. Tom OK. Wow. How many listen to a podcast regularly to kind of get your daily juice of inspiration? Awesome. I wish we would have had that when I was here, but that was a long time ago. So listen, my story and the story of this organization is one of, I'm going to get a little woo here. But there is reality in Wu. And it is about being in tune with yourself enough to know when to seize those opportunities and those business opportunities. Because let's be real, you are all taking a business course because you want to learn how the business world works. You want to learn how to make enough to support yourself, to support your family. But also, I want to talk about the dead end of just thinking about this as a means to an end. If you think about your business career as just putting food on the table and making a lot of money, that is a formula for extreme unhappiness. It is. The point of life is doing something you love. And if you do what you love, success will follow, I promise. Whether that's money success, relationship success, whatever it is. But if you have the goal of just going out and making a grundle of money, that is a, a wasteland of un unhappiness. There's nothing wrong with making money, let me be clear. But that piece that needs to go with it is something that drives you every day. What is that thing that you do when you get out of bed in the morning and you put your feet on the ground that gets you really excited? Like that is your grand passion. I often say to my staff, my biggest job as CEO, my number one job beyond everything else is to help people, help my employees find their grand passion. And I am constantly looking at our employee base to determine, are they in the right role? What would be a better fit for them? What would bring them happiness? So my story is one of, I was a student at SUU. I was student body president. My last year in college, I was hired by the university to run the school relations department. I don't know what it's called now, but basically we were the, the marketing division for the organization. So I would go out recruiting students to come to SUU. And at the time, I really wanted to go to law school. Everything I'd done in my life was about going to law school. I'd had a, an internship in DC that was super cool, like, incredible and I was like this is what I want to do like I probably want to go into politics 
and I definitely want to be an attorney. And so I started applying for law school. And lo and behold, as I sat with one of the counselors here, working through which law schools would be best for me, I'm like, I want to go to the best school I can get into. And they were like, you know what, just go to, the, you know, go to this school or that school. It'll be easy to get into. It's cheaper. I'm like, no, I want to go to the best. So I did. I got into one of the perennial top one, two, three law schools. And I was set. And so my friends and I decided, look, I'm going to law school. They're going to get their business, their master's degree in business, blah, blah, blah. And we knew that our life was changing, that life was suddenly getting much more serious. And so we were like, let's go to Mexico and spend all of our money before life gets serious and we can go have a great time. And so we got in my 1979 Dodge Colt and this car had a different color panel. Every panel was a different color because I'd been in so many accidents. So we got in this car with no air conditioning and we drove and drove and drove and just like had a great time. Stopped along the way, whatever interested us. We ended up all the way down in Puerto Vallarta, which is about 1,800 miles away. And lo and behold, one of the friends that I was with, you know, we woke up one morning and all of the money was gone out of the checking account. It was not me. It was him um, and two of my, that basically our money was gone. And so we had to get back. And we had just enough money for gas and a candy bar each. And we decided that we were gonna drive straight through because we wanted to get home. And it was time for me to go to law school. So we got in my car, we drove. One of the friends I was with, she was like, look, there's this animal sanctuary in Southern Utah that I want to stop at. I'm sponsoring a dog there. It would be really cool. And I was like, nope, we're not doing that. Everybody's tired. We're hungry. And she just kept bugging us. So finally we gave in and we decided to stop. And we pulled into this magnificent canyon in Kanab. How many have been to Best Friends? Okay, you know what I mean when you pull into that drive. And I pulled in and I looked around and it was this remarkable uh, logo. <laughs> um, it was this incredible canyon. And I thought, what is this place? And the only thing that I knew about animal welfare, I had animals my entire life growing up, was that the homeless animals ended up in the pound down by the city dump. You know the routine, right? You go in, they're down by the city dump, and the only shelter that I'd been into was the one in Enoch. And back then, when I went into the shelter in Enoch to look for a cat, how many had animals as a kid? When I went to look for this cat, the cages in the whole shelter were empty. It was in a little dumpy center block building with a tin roof. There was a guy with cowboy boots and a cowboy hat on sitting at the desk. He was reading the paper and he was like, how can I help you? I said, well, I'm here to find an animal. And he said, well, they're all taken care of. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, every morning I take them all out, put them in a barrel, and put the exhaust, hook the exhaust up to the barrel, the exhaust of my truck, and gas these animals. And I was like, what the what? And he said, but I've got a couple of kittens here that are under the desk. If you want them, they're yours. And so I scrabbled around under the desk scooped up these two kittens and, and those kittens became my pets. The thing is, that was not unique. That was happening everywhere around the country. That was my lived experience with how America was treating their best friend. 
and I couldn't believe it. I was like, is this like how we do business here? This can't be real. And so to go from that to this and to meet the founders of this organization and drive through this canyon and have them say to me, like I was just quizzing them with questions. Why did you do this? Why did you decide to move to Southern Utah and buy this ranch to take care of a bunch of animals? And they said to me, because we wanted to plant our stake in the ground and, and ask the simple question, why aren't we trying to figure out how to save our best friends rather than how to best kill our best friends? And back then, 17 million animals were dying every year in America's shelters. 17 million. And this group of friends, there were about 30 of them, they were like about as idealistic as it comes. And they were Cambridge graduates, Oxford graduates, really smart people. They had no plan. They had no business strategy. They didn't know how they were going to make ends meet. And I fell in love, fell in love with this place. We pulled out of the sanctuary. We stopped at the nearest gas station. I popped two quarters into the payphone, and I called my dad, who was a little bit like Mitt Romney, kind of a serial entrepreneur, entrepreneur very charismatic. And I said, hey, dad, I'm not going to law school. I'm not going to go to the University of Virginia. And there was this long paw. <laughs> and he's like, uh, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to move to Kanab, Utah, and work at this animal sanctuary. And he thought I was crazy. And so did all of my friends. So did everyone at this institution that I'd spent so much time with. So did my family, and from there the intervention started to take place. <laughs> and people were coming over to visit, like, Julie, what are you doing? Are you going through a midlife crisis? And back then, at the organization, we were essentially living hand to mouth. We, we barely had enough money to make it through the next day. And it got so bad that it was like do or die. Like, do we want to keep this thing going, or are we going to let it go? And so what we decided to do was go out to uh, different communities all over the western United States, from Los Angeles to Las Vegas to Phoenix to Salt Lake. And we would take a little card table and put, you know, pictures of the animals grab a coffee can and ask for people's donations and a list of names. And that's how we built our, our mailing list. And back then, I was employee number 17. We built the mailing list this way. We'd sit outside a grocery store all day and all night, raising money for the organization. At the end of the evening, I'd go to the bank and put the money into the night deposit. I'd take the list of names, and I would fax it down to this person that would do all the data entry. And the very next day, one of our founders would call and say, hey, I really want to thank you for supporting us, and thank you for the donation. <clears throat> and there are people today that still come to the sanctuary that say, I met you in Santa Fe back in 1987 or 1991. And in Los Angeles, that is how we met all of our A-list celebrities, because they got to go shopping too. And the A-list celebrities that the organization has today is incredible. And it all started from that. And so, we grew, we started to grow as an organization. And um, as we grew, we decided, okay, look, we have got to start bringing in talent that really knows what they're doing. And that started with our logo. And just to give you an idea of the organization, 
Best Friends is now one of the largest animal welfare organizations in the world. So I started as employee 17. Our annual budget, the amount of money that we raised was $800,000 a year. Today we have 900 employees. We've got life-saving centers all over the country. Los Angeles, Manhattan, Atlanta, um, Houston, Salt Lake City, and we just partnered with the Walton family to open our newest, the Walmart folks, to open our newest state-of-the-art center that we're calling the Shelter of the Future in Bentonville, Arkansas. And today, this year, we're a $171 million organization annually. How did we do this? Was it magic? Was it intention? Was it a good business strategy? Was it passion? It was probably a lot of all of that. It is the most unlikely and one of the greatest stories, I think, in, in nonprofits in this country. It is such a cool story. And so we, we knew back then that there, there was so much tragedy in the world, and there still is. I mean, you turn on the news, you go to your Instagram feed, whatever, TikTok, it can be overwhelmingly depressing. And we knew that these animals, they just make you smile. Look at all the smiles on people's faces when you see these animals. Their resilience is incredible. They are incredible. And we knew that we wanted to capitalize on that. We knew that we wanted to build our brand on positivity. And so as we built our names, we hit 5,000 members. And we, we thought we were big time. Like, oh, we've got 5,000 people all over the Intermountain West who are supporting this organization. And we said, OK, the best way to start raising money is to start sending them a newsletter. It's what a lot of nonprofits do. If you are a member, you get the newsletters, right? So we went to visit this guy that uh, runs a mailing house where they pull all the names together and they send out your mailers. And we said to him, hey, we want to share all the good news about these animals. We want to tell the positive stories. And he was like, you're never going to be successful if you do that. It's just not going to happen. And we were like, why not? And he said, because you've got to give people a reason to support you that is a sense of urgency. Like all these other nonprofits are showing the animals dying, you know, dead animals in barrels, skinned animals alive, you know, the kids that don't have any food and they've got flies in the eyes. He's like, that's what's going to get people to donate. And we were like, no. We believe that people want to follow something that's positive and successful. And he's like, well, good luck. You're, you're not going to survive. And so lo and behold, we started sending out these mailings. And not only were they successful, they had the highest return rate of any nonprofit in the country. And then this massive shift started taking place with nonprofits where they started to drop the sad news. And they started to focus on the wins. They started to focus on positivity. And we started to grow. We went from that $800,000 to $10 million, to $18 million. We were consistently one of the fastest growing companies in Utah. And it was all about positive intention. It was all about taking this problem that was 17 million animals a year and figuring out how to solve it by tuning in to what people want. People don't want to hear your BS. They don't want to hear your negativity. People love positivity. You know, it's the 
the attraction, the law of attraction. And so as we went down this road, we saw our logo. <laughs> and our logo used to be these waving animals, cartoon animals, that looked like, you know, kind of this little rescue group in the middle of southern Utah. There was nothing national about it. And back then, we were Best Friends Animal Sanctuary. And we had this situation that happened where we got this call from a, a small rescue group in Maryland. And they called us and they said, please help. We've got these cats at a naval base. And the Admiralty wants to kill these cats. And you're the only organization that has enough muscle to help us save these cats. And the other organizations that are opposed to it are the Humane Society of the United States, the ASPCA, and PETA. And so we were like, all right, we're game. We're going to help you with these cats. And so we go out, we fly out to Maryland, and we meet with the Secretary of the Navy, for real over this issue. And uh, this guy is like, these crazy animal people, there's all this to do. There was all this stuff online about it. Like People were up in arms about these cats. And the funniest part was we were like, you know, we've got a, we've got a remedy. You just need to spay and neuter them and re-release them, and they'll self-manage their population. It's biology. You don't need to kill them. If you kill them, they're just going to repopulate, and it's going to be a chronic problem for you. And so the Secretary of the Navy was like, uh, well, do I believe these high-powered national organizations, or do I believe this organization called Meower Power was the name of this group, for real. And Best Friends Animal Sanctuary in Kanab, Utah, with waving animals. And that was the point that we knew that we had to change our logo and our name. And we did. We sat down with a organization in Los Angeles. And we started looking through our database. And we found that one of our members was the best friend of Steve Jobs. This guy was the guy that created the Apple brand. He's the guy that built that whole vibe of Apple. His name was Lee Clow, and he started a company called Shiat Day. How many have heard of Shiat Day? So he was one of the principals there at Shiat Day. Did the Energizer Bunny campaign, did all the Nissan commercials, how many are fans of Apple? I mean, I'm sure you all have an iPhone. So this guy sat down with us, and he was like, what are you doing? He said, you are all over the map. Look at the messaging that you're sending out. He's like, I want you to send me all of your collateral, all of your posters, your flyers. And back then, we were just like, oh, we need a new logo for this event. We, and literally, for those of us who worked there back in the day, it was scrappy as hell. And it was a lot of fun. Because you were the master of your own destiny. You needed a new logo. You just created it and printed it off, and no one bothered you. So by the time he got his hands on us, we had 18 different logos. I am not kidding you. Letterhead. Everyone had their own letterhead. Everyone had their own logos. And he was like, you need to get your act together because you're diluting your brand. You need to have one singular message, which is save them all, which is what we came up with. And you need one logo lockup, maybe a couple more that you can place in different locations. And so he helped us with, there you go, thank you, with this logo. And it was an immediate hit. And this logo created a lot of anxiety for animal welfare. Because this is a, an industry. This is a field. 
that was ripe for disruption. And if there is something that you're passionate about, I promise you, there is room for disruption. There is room for disruption at the university setting. There is room for disruption in the food industry. There is room for disruption in any industry that you apply your brain to. You just need to find it, but you gotta be passionate about it. I promise you there is room for disruption. Where was our disruption? It was this, because we had shelters all over the country and traditional humane societies that for 150 years had followed the same business model. And that was catch and kill. We need to control the population by killing these animals. And that started in New York City in the late 1800s where there was an outbreak of rabies in New York. And the public was upset by that and they said, look, we're concerned about rabies, rightfully so. So the city put a bounty on all of the dogs, a quarter a dog. And they rounded up the dogs, they put them in a cage and dunked them in the East River. That's how they got rid of animals back then. And the public was outraged and said, wait a second, that isn't what we meant. So what ended up happening is cities started building shelters. And guess what? The same thing happened only behind closed doors for decade after decade after decade until best friends came along and said, what are we doing? We are the wealthiest country in the world. The pet industry and the pet space is one of the fastest growing industries in this country. There is a massive incongruency here and we have the opportunity to really disrupt this space, like in a serious way. And so we did. And we put this out and we said, we believe we can save them all. We believe that we don't have to kill our best friends. And the uproar that we got from the industry about this was insane. And we still get it today. And when I started at Best Friends, there were no no-kill shelters in this country. Not one. Zero. And I can remember staring over the cliffs one day and thinking, this is, we're just a bunch of hippies in the desert. We are a bunch of dream weavers. How can we possibly save them all? There are no shelters that are no-kill. This is like, maybe we bit off more than we can chew. And I thought, you know what, Julie, we need to figure out a way to win. We need to figure out a way that we can bring this message to the public and win. And so back in 2016, I put the stake in the ground to say that we were gonna take every shelter in every community no-kill by the year 2025. And I knew that we needed to innovate again, not just with the messaging, but with our data, because at the end of the day, nobody really knew how many animals were dying in America's shelters. So we went out with volunteers to every single shelter in this country and got their data. And we built this platform that you can find on our website that is a remarkable tool. Would you believe that back in the day, in 2016, there was not a comprehensive list of animal welfare organizations in this country? Municipal. There was no database of organizations, shelters, humane societies. Nobody knew how many shelters there were in this country, let alone how many animals were dying. And so we built this database, and wouldn't you know it, Fast Company named us one of the 10 most innovative companies in the world in data science, along with companies like Snowflake. How many know who Snowflake is? Nobody, okay, well, go look them up, 
they're publicly traded, they're very successful. So we're starting to gain momentum with this data. And we went from no shelters being no kill to today, we're at about 60% of shelters being no kill because we had the data and we could target how to solve the problem. And we have volunteers and staff all over the country that go into shelters every single day and help them remake their systems from within. We did it here in Cedar City. Cedar City just was awarded the 90% award where they're saving 90% of the animals in their shelter. That is remarkable progress. And when I think about the founders of this organization from 1984 to say, we're gonna, we're gonna create a no-kill nation. They had no idea that this was gonna spark a national movement that would be recognized worldwide. They had no plan, no strategy, and to think that they're still alive today and that we're gonna bookend this and actually achieve this by 2025 is remarkable. So to go from 17 million animals to 385,000 animals, that's where we're at today. 385,000 animals are losing their lives. That is so doable, especially when you think about the fact that 17 million people in this country are going to acquire a pet next year. The delta between those two is huge. Like, we can do this. This is so doable. And so I, I would offer this advice to you. Find your passion. And it's not going to be a straight line. Like, if you would have told me when I was sitting here like you, listening to somebody like, whatever, going to law school, who cares? that I would end up here, I wouldn't have believed you, not even for one second. Open yourself up to that opportunity that may surprise you. Follow that passion. The second thing is tap into positivity. There is a power in positivity. It is, uh, it is the greatest gift that we as humans can give each other. And trust me, people want it. They need it. They love it. The third thing is, find that area in your space where you can disrupt, because it exists everywhere. And it's going to start happening at the speed of light. And I would say the other thing is, don't be worried about your competitors. Do not follow the competition. Be you. You do you. You follow your North Star. You do the right thing. And you are going to be successful beyond your wildest dreams. For us to sit here and imagine that this is our greenhouse. We have a greenhouse there, too, just to round out the whole hippie thing. Um, I want to show you. Do we have a picture of the Bentonville, Arkansas Center in there? So, so to think, if you had even said to me five years ago, hey, the heir to the, Wal the Walmart fortune is going to be calling you because she loves cats and she wants to do something about the cat situation in Arkansas and it turns into the shelter of the future that will reimagine the way that we deal with animals in our communities across the country, I would have thought you were crazy. And this kind of thing just continues to happen to this organization. And I'm telling you, you can recreate this. You have the power within you to find that special thing that you're really good at and only you can do. So don't settle. Don't just go to business school and like, well, you do whatever you want. But I'm just saying that every one of us has the power in us to create something really remarkable in this world. 
think twice about that first offer you get. <coughs> really think about what you love and follow that passion. All right, that's all I got today. Thanks for letting me be here. I think we've got seven minutes for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, necessary evil. Yeah, I mean, that's a word that we use a lot, where we say everyone said it was a necessary evil, and for us it's just plain evil. Um, it, it, to me, I am a data wonk. Show me the data. It all comes down to the data. So when we started getting data on these shelters, and we could figure out how many animals what kind of animals were going into the shelter and what zip codes they were from, we could start to build solutions. So in Los Angeles, um, 52,000 animals were going into the shelter system and about half were making it out alive. So they were killing 26,000 animals every year. And we looked at that data and we discovered that 7,000 of those animals were, were little kittens little baby kittens that don't survive in a shelter setting because they're very prone to disease. So they're just killed on intake. And so we set up kitten nurseries where we had kids from UCLA and high schools coming in to bottle feed, bottle feed these kittens. And that took 7,000 animals right off the table, boom, like that. So it's solutions like that where we looked at the data and the truth of the matter is, they're pretty much the same in almost every community. So the ratios have kind of, sh they, they shake out to be about the same. So that's how we've done it. We really look at the data, and it is, it comes down to marketing. You know, people, a lot of people don't know that there are great animals right down the street from you all in Cedar City, where, you could help save a life. And that marketing is so key. And I think that is our, if you were to say, what is our superpower at Best Friends, it's marketing. So I hope that helps answer your question. Yeah. So how does it differ when you guys, when it's time for an animal to go on or to pass away, how does it differ with you guys taking care of that process versus the old process where shelters would just put them down? So we, the, um, this, is, this is an interesting question because sometimes we get beaten up because we're the leaders of the no-kill movement. And some people interpret that as you're going you're gonna to save animals at whatever cost. And that's not true. If an animal needs to be humanely euthanized, we will do that. So if they have terminal cancer or you know, they, they have really serious behavior issues, we will, we will euthanize that animal. There's a difference between euthanasia, which is mercy, and killing, which is unnecessary. If you have a healthy cat in your shelter and you don't think there's space for it in your community and you kill it, that's the difference between us and the old way. And just to give you an idea, when I started in animal welfare, and it really wasn't that long ago, even though I look old, um, they were not measuring the number of animals that died by the life or the soul. They were measuring it by the ton. How much tonnage of waste did you dispose of today? That's how extreme. That is what has happened from Kanab, Utah. Changed this world entirely. So now we're measuring them by the lives, and it's 385,000. That's it. So, OK, any other questions? Yeah. So the color orange in your guys' marketing, is there a significance behind that? Or is it just because it's a different color, and it just kind of stands out? Yeah. 
it was, we went through a whole different, we went through a bunch of color palettes and orange was sort of a, you know, it wasn't really claimed by anyone at that point. You know, red was sort of um, heart association and the American Red Cross and, you know, blue was the Humane Society of the United States. So we really went with orange. Plus it's just cool. Like you've got a cool orange hat on and it does stand out. So the last thing that I'll say, and then, uh, well, I think we've got time for a couple other questions, but I want to talk about the partnership we have with SUU. I might call on you. <laughs> um, so we do have a partnership with SUU, which I'm really, really proud of. But any other questions? Uh, you say to not focus or like look at your competition, but you guys, I'm just curious what you guys did in the fact that you were so small starting out going up against such a massive problem that was nationwide that was just systemic. Like, was there any like, things that you did specifically to be able to make such a, a large dent so fast in that, in that giant uh, problem? I think that our, you know, we started issuing um, the Best Friends magazine, which, you know, back in the day before social media and stuff, magazines were like a really big way to get your message out the door. And our, all of our messaging was positive. It's the wins. We had a, we had a board in our lunchroom over at the sanctuary that was the Wall of Victory. And we would tell all the stories of victory and it was creating this whole different way of thinking about um, sheltering animals. And when you think about a shelter, that's a safe place, right? Well, not with animals, that's where you go to die. And so we sort of just recrafted the narrative and recreated the narrative. And that was kind of our first, we didn't know we were doing that like as a differentiator in the competition. But that's what was happening. And it really differentiated us in a huge way because this is what the public wants. Nobody, unless, I'll just say most people don't want to see animals die. Most people don't want to see a little puppy die or a kitten die. I mean, it's just such a softball issue in many ways that it was easy for us to kind of capture the, the attention of the public. Okay, any other questions? Was there any point between where you are now and when you started with Best Friends Animal Sanctuary where you kind of doubted whether this was the right choice that you were making? Oh yeah. When I lived in a van and showered at the local gym and my first paycheck was 183 bucks and I was looking at my rest of my family that was just really successful money-wise and I thought, what am I doing? You know, there were many points along the way where I was like, this is, I, I made the wrong turn here. But I just kept going because I was so passionate about it and committed. How many times do you get to change the world? Like, how many times do you get to be a part of something so special that you can look back when you're old with your grandkids and say, I did this. I actually changed the freaking world. That's pretty rare. So like, I'm going with that. That's, that's kind of what I kept going back to. It was hard. It wasn't easy. It has not been a cakewalk, but it's been worth all the hard and the good. Okay, so we're gonna talk about our program with SUU. So, um, you know, there's no, there's no degree that you can get in this. Like most people that end up in shelter, uh, shelter world, animal welfare, shelter medicine, there, there's just no resources. And so we now have a partnership with SUU where you, you can actually get a degree in this. And you can get a degree in how to create a no-kill shelter how to be the best shelter director or employee that you can be. 
And this program started out small several years ago, and it's grown to where now you can get a master's degree from SUU in this. And it's pretty freaking cool. So I gave the high level here, but you got to pitch it now. Oh, no, wrong person. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, it's been such a great partnership. Um, I've been able to go to a couple of the conferences, and um, one of the biggest key things that I noticed is that when you think of animal services, you just think veterinarian. You know, I can only be a vet. And there's so many other possibilities inside of animal services. And so we help bring that to life. You can be a shelter owner. You can, all of the steps, you can run a business. So that that's one thing that has been really cool about the partnership. Yeah, it's uh, contemporary animal services. Look it up. It's, uh, if you put that in, SUU plus best friends, you can read all about it. If you're, you should just try it out. Take one of the courses. Um, if anything, it'll make you a better human. Um, and I think it's, uh, just to give you guys an idea, it's, we have a, oh, there we go. You're, you're really good, you know? <laughs> so here we go. Um, you know, there's a lot of leadership opportunities in this world and for example our IT department you know our technology department we have a really robust technology department I'm really into data about 150 people and these are like PhD people that are starting to apply for jobs with best friends like I sometimes think I would not get hired at this organization today because there's so many qualified people that want to work for us, but check it out. Um, you know, you can learn a lot about your four-legged friends by doing this. All right, any other questions? What position do you hold in the company? I'm the CEO. You're the CEO. Now. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I, I started in the mail room, the proverbial mail room. Back then, we didn't have job descriptions. There was no HR. You'd show up. And they'd say, hey, this radiator on this truck needs to be fixed. And I didn't know what I was doing, so I'd go down to the local mechanic. And they'd show me. Like, you, it was that sort of bootstrap operation. One day, I put in an irrigation system. I had to mend fences. I'd take care of dogs, horses, give a tour, answer the phone. And I really just worked my way up through the organization. I took over. All, all of our outreach programs, I took over our marketing, our funder. I've basically done every job in the organization, to be honest. So are the people who founded it originally still in it? Or? They are. Yeah, so we have, there were about 25 founders, about half have passed away, and the other half are still actively involved, and that's very important to me. We've got like our very own founding fathers and mothers here at the organization that started this movement. Um, think about the environmental movement or any movement you're passionate about. I've got them right there at my disposal to call anytime I want to ask their opinion. It's really cool. There was one other question. Is there a last, last question? How do you guys afford the spade and neutering since that stuff can be super expensive? Um, you know, it's just something that we, yeah, we've got $170 million to work with, so spay neuter is a big part of that formula. And um, with our own veterinary team, it's not really that expensive. The, the cost that the public is charged through a regular veterinarian can be expensive, but for us, it's worth it, you know. Okay, thank you for allowing me to be here today.